All attendees are in listen-only mode. Good morning, good afternoon. Uh, I'm Lauren Wenzel. I'm the director of the National Marine Protected Areas Center at NOAA, and we're very pleased to be hosting this webinar as part of our monthly MPA webinar series with Open Channels and EDM Tools Network. So um, glad to have you all with us, and we're especially glad to have um, Chloe Harvey with us today, and we're going to be learning about green fins, a tool for reducing the direct impacts of diving and tourism industries. And I will introduce Chloe here in just a minute, but I think you all know the practice here on these webinars. I definitely encourage you to type in your questions in the question box on the webinar interface. We want to make sure we get a chance to have that online conversation with you after Chloe's presentation. So please go ahead and, uh, and send those along. Um, so Chloe is a marine biologist and professional diver, and she has worked alongside the UN environment uh, and with her team at the Reef World Foundation, and they have been working to develop and establish Green Fins Initiative to promote environmental stewardship and compliance uh, within the dive tourism industry. Since 2008, Chloe has worked with over 500 dive centers and government agencies in nine countries to build capacity for sustainability within the industry, and she is recognized as a world expert on sustainability in the diving industry. So welcome, Chloe, and I will turn it over to you. Thank you very much. So um, hi, everyone. Uh, thanks to the team for, for organizing this webinar today, and thank you to everyone out there for joining us as well. Um, so as, as just introduced, this, this webinar is about green fins, which is a tool for reducing the direct impacts of diving and, uh, diving and tourism industries. Um, so my name's Chloe, as mentioned, and I represent the Reef World Foundation, which is a UK charity, and we've been working in partnership with the UN Environment on the development and implementation of green fins since 2004. So today, I think by looking at some of the names, I can see there's some dive centers um, attending or dive center managers who have actually already picked up green fins, which is really nice. And we have some marine practitioners as well. So it's a good mix. So I'll try and keep the content relevant to you all. But jumping into the outline of, of the webinar, I'm going to be talking for about 20 to 25 minutes. Um, and then you guys can have a chance to ask questions. So do so, please. I look forward to that part the most. Um, so I'm going to run through the issue, uh, the solution that Greenfins is, is, is presenting to the issue. Um, we're going to talk about the three elements of Greenfins, awareness raising, certification of dive and snorkel centers, and regulatory support. And then we're going to talk about what the expected outputs of implementing the program could be. So first of all, the issue. Tourism is currently one of the largest and fastest growing sectors in the world. The World Tourism Organization recorded over 1 billion international tourists in 2015, and it's predicted that this is going to double by 2030. So this represents a significant economic value, contributing to 9% of GDP globally and providing 1 in 11 jobs. And furthermore, current regional figures are predicting that the Americas will continue to show the fa fastest growth in, in tourism numbers alongside Asia and Pacific region. So if not well managed, marine tourism activities can bring environmental risk. Tourism can constitute a locally significant driver of marine life degradation, putting pressures on the ecosystem through direct and indirect impacts associated with developing infrastructure, as well as other activities. And significant diver damage has been recorded on frequently dived reefs. So this is why it's really important that we work to promote a sustainable industry. So while dive tourism is a risk, more than that, it's an opportunity for raising awareness, letting people understand more about the marine world and why we should protect it. So by managing local direct impacts from marine tourism activities, we can help to build ecosystem resilience to more wide-scale threats such as overfishing, climate change, those other threats that we often feel powerless um, against. We can also help to improve marine life health and sustain ecosystem services for people and for businesses. So as environmental managers, as some of us are, and we can often feel that tourism management is not within our mandate, but environmental management is. And so here I present Greenfins as a solution to 
promoting sustainable diving tourism industries. So Greenfins is an approach for managing the environmental impacts of diving and snorkeling activities on coral reefs. First and foremost, Greenfins is a code of conduct, 15 actions and activities that dive centers can follow to reduce their environmental impact. It's also a robust assessment system to monitor and promote compliance with the code. It also provides strategic outreach to and capacity building among diving and snorkeling centers, as well as government agencies, and support towards developing or strengthening relevant regulatory frameworks. So it's a program that's really been developed by divers for divers. It's, it's showing to influence core businesses, and it's proven and replicable. So on that note, where is it? So Greenfins has currently been adopted by the governments of Thailand, Malaysia, Indonesia, <coughs> Vietnam, Maldives, the Philippines, and next month we'll actually be launching into um, Palau and hopefully Sri Lanka. We've also got plans for expanding to the Medi Mediterranean, the Caribbean, and the Red Sea. So the program's expanding fast. We're hoping to make it available to as many dive centers as possible in the future. So who is Greenfins? Greenfins is not an NGO. It's not an organization. It's a management approach that can be adopted by anyone. It's actually an initiative of the UN Environment, and it's implemented through my charity, the Reef World Foundation. And it's adopted by governments or NGOs and different marine resource managers who want to, who are working to protect the marine environment, manage the impacts and influence the marine environment. And also, through dive, it works through the dive centers. So the dive centers adopt the code of conduct and use that through their business practices. So typically, Greenfins is implemented at a national level based on the network approach, bringing together the industry and the government agencies with technical advice from the UN environment and from Reef World. So why do governments get involved? So Greenfins actually helps governments to deliver on international environmental targets, such as Convention of Biological Diversity, IT Target 10, and other ones as well, and Sustainable Development Goals, for example, number 14 on oceans. So this, in turn, helps to sustain the program in each of the countries that it's operating in. So from a dive center's point of view, this is what the membership process can look like once the program is implemented within their local area. So dive and snorkel centers sign a membership form. They then receive learning and outreach tools and training. That's given to them by assessors who are trained by the Reef World Foundation. The assessment is then carried out of their business practices, and then they're certified. So this is done annually. And if there's no improvement on their, in their, their um, annual assessment, then they'll be suspended. So this is how Greenfins is driving that change within the industry. So certification of the businesses is a really proud moment. People are really happy to be part of Greenfins. And uh, I think there's a quote from Carl, um, who's a dive center owner in the Philippines, that really sums this up. He says that Greenfins is not some over-the-counter accreditation. They assessed our dive shop and dive masters on actual dives and made suggestions on how we can improve. So they really are involved in the process as, as business managers. We come in, uh, Greenfins comes in and, and talks to them about how they can improve, where, where they can see and room for improvement, and then work together to overcome some of the challenges. So that's from a dive center point of view. Now, what can green things look like on, on a site level? Just to give you a bit more information, I'm going to talk to you through a case study in the Philippines, um, El Nido, a, a very, very beautiful destination in the Philippines. Um, it's experienced booms, a booming tourism industry just recently, mainly because of an expanding runway locally. And the pressures have mainly been felt on the marine environment through snorkeling activities. And there's been a strong lack of effective management because it happened so quickly. So a local NGO contacted the Reef World Foundation and asked about having green fins implemented in their local area. So we went over and we trained up a number of their staff. We also engaged local government and trained some of the, the local government staff as well. And then we helped them to conduct training and performance assessments of snorkel operators locally. So this resulted in very positive customer feedback. Some great TripAdvisor um, comments were left. And other snorkel centers then wanted to voluntarily get involved as well. So we soon had over 80 snorkel operators join the program in that one small um, area. 
And the result has been improved practice, and also we've seen a lot of industry self-policing, so snorkel centres saying to other snorkel centres while out on the water, you shouldn't be doing that because you're a green fins dive centre, which is a really nice result of the programme there. So now I'm just going to talk through the three elements of green fins. So this is really the bulk of my presentation today. So first of all, awareness raising. So this is through the production and distribution of learning materials and delivery of training workshops for local dive industry. So I'll talk about that in more depth in a moment. The second element of Greenfins is certification of dive and snorkel centres. This is done through environmental performance, which is evaluated using a robust assessment system. Again, I'll talk about that in just a moment, but that does require um, capacity building intervention from the Reef World Foundation. And then finally, regulatory support. So the process of strengthening laws and regulations requires information which is originally gained through Greenfins implementation, such as what the high risk activities are and currently what the greatest challenge within the local industry is. And what can be supported by the local industry as well, what are they willing to do? So that final element has to wait until after implementation of the full Greenfins approach. As I mentioned before, the certification requires um, capacity building intervention from ReefWorld. But the awareness raising activities can really start any time and anyone can pick this up and start running with this immediately from today. So I'm going to talk about this a little bit now, sorry. So awareness raising. This is through the production and distribution of learning materials first of all. So as the UN Environment's lead technical partner on green fins, Reef World has been documenting and collecting practical solutions to daily environmental challenges over the past 12 years during our work to help the diving industry implement the Green Fins Code of Conduct. And we put all of these lessons into what we call the Green Fins Toolbox, which is an analogical description for the combining of all these lessons and tools. So the toolbox can be accessed through the download section of the Green Fins website and comprises of three handbooks and the Green Fins Pack, which is the entire collection of guides, posters, presentations and forms needed for Green Fins implementation. So these handbooks offer step-by-step -step practical guidance for implementing green fins at first of all the dive centre level, the site level for local resource managers, and at the national level for national authorities. So the dive centre handbook is obviously what a dive centre manager would want to, to get hold of to start to implement green fins best practice within their operations. But I'm going to dive into the site level handbook today and just let you know what it looks like. So these are presented as ebooks once you download them off the, on, on, off the website. So the handbooks, each of them walks you through steps of how you would go about implementing it, either at the dive site or national level. And it also outlines what resources and capacity are needed. So for example, in this site level handbook, it talks through the um, enabling elements for implementation and then also you know, for example, what, who, what the assessors, who the assessors might be, what skills they need, and how many you might need for, for implementing greenfins at your local site. So the greenfins pack. This contains a series of guidance documents, posters, and forms that you can use to promote best practice for diving and snorkeling. I'm going to briefly introduce just the main ones now and explain how they can be used. So here you can see the code of conduct on the right hand side. So this is the list of the 15 actions and activities which dive and snorkel centers agree to follow as Greenfins members. By following these environmental practices, uh, their, their environmental impact will be reduced. So there's some obvious ones, for, for example, looking at um, uh, no touch policy number 15, so um, divers not touching any, anything underwater or looking at um, best practice for divers underwater. But then th there's other things. We're looking at the industry as a, as a whole. So looking at a minimum discharge policy. What are people doing where they use batteries? What are they doing without oil? What facilities are available locally to dive operations to be able to safely dispose of those hazardous um, products, for example? Looking at garbage management. So it really is a holistic approach to looking at um, best environmental practice throughout the whole of the operation. So the guidelines for the Code of Conduct provides more practical guidance to each of these Code of Conduct points. So this categorizes actions and responsibilities into the three main audience groups that you find within a dive operation. 
So the actual operation, management, the dive staff, and then of course the customers. So this can be printed out as a large single poster or as individual categories to be displayed at dive sites and dive centers or in tourist thoroughfares such as airports. So this is what we call the, the Greenfins icons, and these were developed first of all by Greenfins in Thailand and with our, our support. But they've quickly become very popular in the diving industry and uh, have been adopted by all of the active Greenfins countries now. And they've since been translated into loads of different languages, Chinese or, Jap or Korean, um, Ch Japanese, uh, Vietnamese, Russian. It's, they're available in lots of different languages. So these provide an excellent tool for dive guides environmental briefings and are being used by local and national governments across Southeast Asia to promote best practice within their MPAs and national parks as well. Their very visual guidance have been seen to be very popular. So the diving industry made a request and, were, uh, and asked us to um, develop these icons into something that can be taken underwater. And so we, we put together these flashcards. So with the help of the dive staff, we selected the most relevant of these icons and, and then put them onto these flashcards, which can be printed onto waterproof paper, fit inside a BCD pocket nicely, and they can be used to manage guests underwater. So it's just three pages that can be printed off and put into a BCD pocket. The Greenfin's philosophy is very much one of sharing and educating, and all the learning material focuses on helping the industry explain or, or relay certain messages to their guests. So one example is this no fish feeding poster, which explains step by step what the negative impacts of, of feeding um, marine life is. So this is really to help dive businesses to say no to fish feeding, which is often a very popular activity. Another example is this recipe for environmentally friendly cleaning products, which can be made at home to replace products like Dettol, which are commonly used to, to clean dive kits. We have a whole series of posters. So here's the, the no collecting, buying or displaying of marine life souvenirs. No to say no to plastic. How long does it take for trash to break down? Why we should safely dispose of used batteries and oil. And then different guidelines, such as environmental briefing guidelines and underwater photography guidelines. We also now have a series of how-to videos as well that offers um, more visual guidance to each of these challenges. Um, so you can, you can just go to the Green Fins YouTube channel and search through the videos. They're being released one by one throughout the months of this year. So these posters are now all available in, in Chinese, um, simplified as well as traditional, as well as Korean and Japanese. And if you'd like to produce any of these in bulk for distribution or would like to have a large signboard featuring any of the visuals, please let us know and we can help with the graphic design and also include your logo where appropriate. So I'll include our, our details to contact us at the end. But as they stand, all of these materials are available for free download on the Greenfins website. So please visit the website you can do a one button download for the entire pack or you can browse the entire collection and select those that are most relevant to your needs and interests. So now I'd like to show a video. I'm not sure if this is going to work, but um, we'll give it a go. And I'm going to be told if it's not working so well. Yeah, Chloe, we can't hear Jim Toomey talking. No. Okay, that's fine. We thought that might be the case. Thanks for letting me know. Okay, but we so can we share it. We can share it afterwards. Exactly. So we'll share it along with the archive of the of the um, webinar afterwards. But also, if you just um, go to if you just Google Greenfins for a Blue Planet, then the video pops up. So you you can you can find it that way as well. So it's just a short, fun animation about Greenfins, putting it into context. Um, with a bit more information. So, 
So I also talked about the fact that there's awareness raising workshops as well. So as well as distributing the learning materials, um, marine tourism industry representatives can be engaged through workshops which aim to provide training in the use of the GreenFins tools and sharing of best practice. So this is about a 45 minute session with all the dive staff. Um, it can be done as a series of sessions at each dive centre or as a group workshop. So they should be held outside of diving hours to encourage participation. We have to remember how busy the diving industry is. Um, and it really encourages the sharing of information between the industry and whoever the agency is that's picked up green fins and they're managing it locally. So once again, as with everything, the Greenfins presentation is available on the Greenfins website for download. Um, it's a great presentation that dive management can pick up and use as well in their dive centers for training their staff as well. So coming back to the three elements, I've just talked you through the first and hopefully you feel that you have the tools that you need if you'd like to get going with that. And like I said before, I've included our contact details at the end of the presentation. So please don't hesitate to contact us with any questions. I'm now going to briefly introduce the second and third elements of the Greenfins management approach. The second being certification of dive and snorkel centers, which requires capacity building and technical support from Reef World and the UN environment. And the third is regulatory support, which requires some level of previous application of Greenfins first. So on to certification. Let's talk about how the actual certification system looks. So dive and snorkel centers are assessed against the code of conduct to monitor what practices are in place and measure how effectively they are removing risk to the marine environment. Assessors are qualified by Reef World following training on the use of an assessor manual, which provides guidance to a comprehensive criteria. Each code of conduct item is graded either red for high risk, yellow for medium risk, and green for no risk of damage to the marine environment. And then an overall environmental performance score is generated based on this. The maximum score is 330 for highest risk and zero for lowest risk. So therefore, with Greenfins, zero is best. So this allows Greenfins teams to track how well dive and snorkel centers are performing as individual businesses or as a community at a destination or even on a national level. And this way we can identify challenges and address these with solutions and tailored awareness raising. So does it actually work? In every location and every destination that Greenfins has been implemented, we see an annual drop in average environmental scores across the dive centers assessments. So it has been proven to improve environmental practice. Another quote, um, Julian Hyde, who's a dive centre or was a dive centre owner in Malaysia and also is manager at Reef Check Malaysia. So he, he believes that Greenfins is the only thing that's changing the way the diving industry does things. In addition to resulting in improved environmental practices, we've also performed studies that have observed diver behaviour and mo monitoring rates of damaging diver contacts underwater. And results have shown that divers diving with operators who are compliant to the Greenfins Code of Conduct make significantly less damaging contacts than those diving with dive operators who are non-compliant. So therefore, we can say that Greenfins effectively reduces direct diver damage and may lead to improved marine life health. So that's the science bit. <laughs> so coming back to the, the three elements of Greenfins, I just talked you through awareness raising activities and the certifications, and now I'm just going to touch very briefly on the third, which is regulatory support. So as I mentioned before, to effectively inform the strengthening of laws and regulations, we first need to have implemented Greenfins. But once we have, the following steps can be taken. So in collaboration with national or local partners, and with the support of the UN environment, ReefWorld can conduct an analysis of relevant uh, conduct analysis of current relevant laws and regulations. Analysis of Greenfin's environmental assessment data can highlight the specific actions and activities associated with the reef tourism industry posing the greatest environmental threat. So we have a good review of, of what laws are in place and we have a good idea of what actual activities are, are causing the greatest environmental impact. And with that information, we can recommend revision or reform of legislative frameworks targeted to regulate activities posing the greatest environmental threat. And this is all done in consultation with the Greenfins Dive Centre. So therefore, we have very informed stakeholders that are open to these changes. 
So that's it for, for the regulatory support. So in summary, the three elements of Greenfins are awareness raising activities, which can be conducted by any dive center or resource manager with immediate effect. The second is the certification of dive and snorkel centers to be able to measure and promote compliance to best practice and requires training from Reef World first. And then the third is regulatory support, which is a result of initial implementation. So if anyone's interested in, in exploring the, the option of implementing the full Greenfins approach in their area, I suggest that you first read the site and national level handbooks um, and then contact us with more information. So Greenfins is constantly expanding, like I, I said at the beginning of the presentation, and we're always looking for new partnerships and collaborations to continue to, to make it available to more dive centers around the world. So just at the end of, of this presentation now, I'm just going to talk through what the expected outputs that, that um, you can expect from Greenfin's implementation. And this is more from a site level implementation as opposed to a dive center. Um, but if you, if you implement Greenfin's on a national level or within a diving destination, um, you can expect to engage private sector stakeholders in environmental activities. You can expect increased participation in citizen science programs, which results in more crucial data. You can expect stakeholders who are more informed on local laws and regulatory frameworks, which can lead to reduction in conflict. You'll gain improved awareness of the threats associated with the reef tourism industry and solutions to address those. And improved environmental practices within reef tourism activities or, and reduced impact on the local marine environment. So in summary, the key messages from this today, environmental impacts associated with marine tourism are becoming an increasing concern globally. Greenfins provides a wide network of individuals who have been working to overcome these issues for over 10 years. Greenfins offers a proven approach to managing a sustainable tourism industry with measurable results. The tools to help you to promote best practice in line with Greenfins are freely available for your use today. So I encourage you to join the network and be part of the movement in whichever capacity is possible. We will continue to drive Greenfins to respond to the need of the, of the industry and of governments, striving to deliver practical solutions which are industry-led please feel free to contact me and our team on info at greenfins.net or my, my email address is chloe at reef-world.org. Visit the website, download away, and then come to us with any questions that you might have. I look forward to hearing from you. Thanks for your time, everyone. All right. Thank you very much, Chloe. That was really, really interesting and great to hear about the work that you're doing. So we do Thank have you. a couple of questions here. And uh, I'll get to those in a moment. I just wanted to encourage folks to go ahead and send in your questions via the webinar interface. We'd love to, to hear from you. <clears throat> so Tom Baker has a question. Uh, he asks or says, the most efficient route to dev improving diver performance is through the training agencies. I'm somewhat critical of the certification courses as too brief and undemanding. Buoyancy skills are often terrible at the end of the course, and this is a major reason why divers damage reefs. Have you approached the training agencies? Yeah, that's a really good question. Thank you. So who was that from? That was from Tom Baker. Okay, thanks, Tom. Um, <coughs> really good question. The answer is yes, we have a lot. Um, and we are working with a number of the major, major agencies as well, training agencies, to help to strengthen the environmental content within their training um, material. I completely agree. You know, if, if you're taught in a certain way at the beginning of your diving career, then how do you know uh, any other way to dive? Um, there's a great new movement called off the bottom training, um, which all of your training is done without touching the bottom at all. So, you know, his, uh, traditionally we're taught to kneel on the, on the pool floor and then on the seabed when we're doing our exercises while we're being trained, and this is all off the bottom. So as a diver, that, that philosophy of going to the bottom for safety never comes into it. You're always feeling secure in midwater, and this is something that we really heavily promote and really encourage. So I think that um, while we haven't seen any major changes within the training content yet, because it's only something we've really started doing um, recently, 
um, I'm really pleased to hear that, that you support that movement because it's something that we're going to be putting an awful lot of effort into trying to have that influence over the, the coming years. So please keep an eye out. It might not say that it's Greenfield's material, but you'll, you'll recognize some of the messages, that's for sure. Okay, uh, here's another question. Have you worked in places where impacts from diving have not yet been evaluated? Um, sometimes people say there's no impact of diving just because the number of divers doesn't seem to be causing harm, but they don't consider the quality of the diving experience. And just interested in hearing if you have had that experience and how receptive the operators were in those areas. Where, wherever we've worked, I mean, if you look at the, the countries that, that Greenfins has been implemented in so far, it's in these tourism hotspots across Southeast Asia. So it's where there's this real booming tourism industry where the, the effects of the tourism industry are, are stark and shocking. Um, but there have been some emerging dive destinations within the countries that we're working in that we have, we have also launched Greenfins. And um, we've always been had the dive operators have always been very receptive to green fins because I mean the, the one side of green fins is obviously it's a great tool to reduce environmental impact but it's also a great marketing tool for a dive operation as well so um, it's usually something that's that's um, welcomed with open arms and of course wherever these emerging destinations are it's expected that tourism is going to grow there so the sooner you can get best practice as commonplace the better long term Okay, um, and related to that question, a question from Karsten Schein at NOAA who's asking, have you ever had any dive centers that declined to join Green Fins, and if so, what reasons did they give, or did they yeah. change their minds? Yeah, we have. Yeah, we, we've had all, all of those. We've had people that are, are not interested at all from the beginning. Um, we've had people that join and then decide not to be a member anymore. And um, we usually, when Greenfins is launched in a destination, we usually get about 70 to 75 percent sign up rates. And remember, it's voluntary and it's free, so we get about 70 to 75 percent sign up rates. And then um, that grows over the years to 80, 90 percent. But the thing is, is we're not actually aiming for 100 percent membership every dive center to be a Greenfins member. And um, sometimes, actually, the elite dive operators, maybe we should be having a special membership for them, those people that are really working hard to promote best practice. Um, so we, we have had people that have declined membership. And usually, it's because um, perhaps the operation um, hasn't the capacity to, to uh, implement these practices. Already the, the, the operation is very busy, maybe, and it's difficult for them to, to do anything more. Um, or the other side of it is perhaps they can feel a bit um, nervous about what perhaps the, the process might be, having someone from the outside, or often it's a government staff member coming into your dive operation, diving with your customers, and then providing you with feedback on, on how well you did can be a bit intimidating. So often um, that can be a reason for, for why people decline membership. But usually we find that the majority of people come on board after a small amount of time. And of course, there's always going to be that, that percent of, of citizens that are just not interested in environmental work. Um, and we have to accept that. So you mentioned that uh, it doesn't cost the dive centers anything. So can you talk about how the program is funded? Yeah, well, it's, it's different in, in each, each location or each country. Um, so the Reef World Foundation, so our work internationally where um, our capacity building work is supported through grants um, and donations. And then in each of the countries where Greenfence has been adopted, it's actually been adopted as a national program. So it becomes part of a wider um, program for protecting coral reefs or um, environmental management coastal marine management and so therefore it becomes part of the national program for and becomes um, supported by national funds in that sense as well so we also help um, national teams to raise funds through grant writing as well and um, in some of the countries that we work in for example the Maldives and um, the geographic nature of the country makes it very difficult for a assessor team who are based in Mali, which is the capital, to reach all atolls or all islands within within the Maldives. 
So the dive centers there actually support the assessors' travel costs to come to their, their dive operations to do the assessments. So that's a, a large overhead. Um, and then obviously the personnel costs are then covered by national government funds um, beyond that. So it's a variety of different ways in each of the countries that we, we work in. And part of the Reef World Foundation's work in the beginning set up time of Greenfins in a new country is to actually sit down and work out how Greenfins can be institutionalized within um, the national systems to be able to support it long term. We're actually exploring different methods as well um, in, in new countries where it's going to be very private sector led um, and the private sector actually going to be directly funding um, because that's where the benefits felt. So there's the private sector put their hands up and said that they'd like to support the program long term. So it's different mechanisms in each country and whichever mechanism works best. Okay. Uh, I've got a question here from Rennie Myers from the University of Rhode Island Marine Affairs um, asking about who the assessors are and could dive professionals act as assessors if they were trained? Yeah, great question again. Um, so the assessors are um, often members of the national government or the local government team or NGO team that have, have that want to implement green fins locally. Um, they have to have a minimum of 50 dives because these guys are obviously going to be going into the water with, with dive teams, so they need to be um, good divers. Um, they need to be able to speak English and the local language as well. And they need to have good communication skills because Greenfins is all about communication. Um, so there have been, uh, in some of the countries that we've worked in, we have trained up local diving instructors who are working freelance. So we can't train anyone who is actually associated with a single dive operation because if you think about it, it's very difficult for a business to accept a competitor's staff to come in and learn about the way that they're running their business. So um, it, it needs to be someone who's neutral within the diving industry if, if they're coming from the industry. But there's no reason why a freelance diving instructor can't be a Greenfins assessor. Okay. But, but, but most often it's actually, it, it, it is usually government staff or NGO staff who are working as marine resource practitioners or, or marine MPA managers, etc., who are already tasked with other jobs such as marine monitoring or, you know, that their diving is already part of their job. And so, therefore, they then step into, in, in Palau, for example, we're training up the um, Karor State Rangers. So, they're already working to, um, diving is already part of their job. And so, Greenfins will become another part of, of their role to be able to monitor the diving industry there. So, we have a couple questions about some problems in the water that, uh, that they're wondering if green fins can help address. One is about sunblock and whether you've incorporated that into your materials, the impacts yeah, another, of sunblock on corals. Another, another really good question. Um, it is included within the, mini, the minimum discharge um, code of conduct item, but it is a very difficult one for us to police. Um, it's been there's been there's a lot of conflicts surrounding it. Um, asking someone not to use sun cream when they're in a tropical destination is is a very difficult thing to do. There are obviously ways that we can minimise risk. We can we have different policies in place asking customers not to use sun cream or not to apply sun cream 30 minutes before going diving, and if they can cover up or stay out of the sun as much as possible without using sun cream, then that's obviously um, encouraged as well, but we, we don't have an all-out all ban of um, of sun cream. Um, we have done extensive research into reef-friendly sun creams, and it's it's very difficult again for us to jump on the bandwagon of any one brand. And we're still keeping an eye out for one that can be something that we can promote globally is is accessible to all dive centres. Um, but often national teams, uh, Greenfins national teams, pick up brands that are locally available and promote those. Um, there's a, a, a Greenfins team that are working out of an island in Malaysia who are promoting a specific brand and they're helping to get it accessible to local dive centers and to promote to their customers on the island. Great. So there's a couple of questions here about interacting with local hotels and resorts. Um, 
one from Sabine Janik who's commenting that their biggest problem with fish feeding is not so much with dive operations but with the big hotels on the island. Um, and they don't want to give it up because they say that that's what the tourists want. Um, and, uh, and another question asks kind of how much uh, Greenfins has been engaged with resorts and particularly with respect to habitat loss and land-based sources of pollution. Wow, two, two good questions. So first of all, Sabine, I, I feel your pain. <laughs> um, no, I completely understand that situation. I guess it's the, the resorts maybe doing snorkeling trips that she's talking about, the fish feeding activities. And it's a real challenge, um, especially when people are so um, of the mindset that fish feeding is an activity that they just simply can't put down because tourists won't keep on coming back if they don't. And actually, um, it's, it's something that we just have to keep on working with that specific operation on and let them recognize that um, actually best practice is something that customers are asking for more and more. And the more that we can get tourists to demand sustainable practice or, or to speak out when they're seeing these unsustainable practices, the better, the easier our jobs will be with that. But we have worked with snorkel operations um, and with big hotels that offer snorkel trips. And we have managed to change their mindset by providing them with information. And um, I know it might sound a bit cheesy, but often education is, or lack of education or awareness, is the main driver of some of these practices. And if you really outline how these practices are impacting their local marine environment and how, especially if you do this with the tourists, um, actually, um, as well as the business owners and, and the snorkel and dive guides, um, people will, won't want to do it because people don't want to feel like they're harming the environment that they've come to see or that they're actually relying on for their business. And I know that it can feel sometimes like you're hitting your head against a brick wall by trying to encourage these sorts of practices, but continuing to educate and making this information available will change people's mindsets. And so by circulating posters like the Say No to Fish Feeding infographic, I, I know a lot of companies that have really found that it's transformed the way that they've dealt with customers. It's no longer a conflicting situation. It becomes a learning process and actually adds value to the, the services that they're offering. So I'd encourage you to just keep on <laughs> keep on trying and it is something that we have worked with as well, yes, in the past. Um, I think the second, would you mind just repeating the second question? The second question was about um, the impacts that resorts can have on issues like habitat loss and land-based sources of pollution. Oh yes, of course, yes, oh, blimey, yeah, huge. Um, at Greenfins itself works directly with dive and snorkel operations. So um, the, the Greenfins members are all operators who um, offer tours that go out and go diving and snorkeling. So if we are working with a, um, for example, if there's a big resort that has a dive operation, dive resort attached to it, <coughs> and they have, um, they've got plans to um, remove a mangrove forest on the foreshore or to do um, some sand mining to open up a local area, then that would be something that would directly affect their Greenfins assessment score. So it would be recognized within our system. But our work stays solely within the dive or snorkel operation. It doesn't step into the greater realms of the resort. That's that's an, a different, um, that's looking at very different impacts. And there are actually certification systems that, that do look into that. Um, we've done a lot of awareness raising activities with staff of resorts um, to pr promote best practice, but Greenfins is really focused very much on diving and snorkeling operations. And related to that, have you been able to influence any government to implement environmental laws related to diving? Yes, I'm proud to say that we have. Yeah, we've influenced an, an awful lot of laws and regulations. Um, local municipal ordinances through to national laws um, and this is where Greenfins becomes a lot more sustainable within a country long term as well by embedding it within national law um, it, it really means that it's it's there for the long run so um, I, I don't want to list out a, <laughs> a huge number um, but different, uh, different coral reef initiatives have also the national initiatives have incorporated the Greenfins Code of Conduct as an example of best practice um, or in uh, marine protected areas laws 
um, they've also seated the Green Fence Code of Conduct. Um, it's an easy thing to pick up and slot in to, to marine laws. It speaks very, very nicely to legislation. So and it's been used um, widely in that regard as well. And there are a few questions about um, wanting green, food, green fins to come to a dive shop near them. Uh, <laughs> definitely some interest in, in uh, green fins in the Caribbean and wondering what is the plan or timeline for expanding into the Caribbean. I am based, says Ben Shapiro, I am based in the Dominican Republic and have not heard anybody mention this certification and think it would be excellent. Ben, <laughs> great, great. Contact us. So um, Dominican Republic is actually one of the, the sites that we're, we're really strongly looking at and um, we're looking to work with reef checks there. Um, funding, um, unfortunately, it's always the same thing. So like I said before, we use lots of different funding mechanisms to get green things up and running because it's not, it's not a paid for membership scheme. Um, and because we use lots of different mechanisms and we're, we're finding new exciting ways to fund it, it does mean that it can sometimes take a long time. But the more we hear from the industry that you want green fins in an area, the more um, our voices, the bigger our voices when we go to different agencies, government agencies or um, regional seas programs, for example, um, and present the, the need for green fins in an area. So please, if you're sitting there thinking, I'd like to have green fins here, do get in contact. I know a lot of you have already. <laughs> we, we get a huge amount of, um, of emails from dive operators that are interested. Um, but meanwhile, you, you can you can pick green fins up. You can use the green fins, um, the handbook for dive centers, dive center handbook, and you can use any of the green fins materials. They're, they're all the green fins posters are all freely available. Although the handbook has a very small donation um, associated with it, I think it's twenty five dollars. But then you have a handbook forever. Um, all of the materials are free. You can put them up in your dive operation. It's just you won't be able to get certified, which I understand is is a really big part of the process until we come and set up green fins locally so yeah contact us um, and hopefully you know green fins dominican republic isn't too far off the horizon but i can't promise it's going to be in the next week or two that's for sure uh do you have a sense of uh other other potential areas in the caribbean where you might work we've had so much interest barbados jamaica um Antigua and Babua, 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 and um, uh, Colombia and loads of different countries have um, dive centers in, in those countries have contacted us and actually a lot of those countries that I just listed the governments have also expressed an interest as well so it's just about pulling all of the, the strings together and making it actually happen. And um Another area that's interested in having green fins from uh, Vinicius Giglio is uh, is uh, the southwestern Atlantic, which I'm guessing, and, and asking if there's interest in translating the material into Portuguese. So it sounds to me like perhaps this is Brazil. Uh, okay. I don't know how much of a presence you have there, but it sounds like you have uh, some interest there. Yeah, that's great. Another a new area. I don't think we've ever had um, interest from that area. Portuguese is not, um, the materials are not available in Portuguese, I'm sad to say, They're, they are soon to be released in Spanish. Um, but yeah, Portuguese would be interesting. So um, if you're willing to help us with the translations, if you find it useful, if there's a need for the, the materials in Portuguese, then of course we'd be willing to facilitate that if we've got um, a, a volunteer to translate the materials, then yeah, get in contact, please. And a couple of folks from Indonesia and Philippines talking about potential partnerships. Lorna McFarlane asks, have you considered partnering with existing conservation organizations who already have field sites for students in coral hotspots? For example, Operation Wallacea has sites all over and many in Indonesia. Um, yeah, so you're up late. <laughs> Thank you very much for joining us, my goodness. Um, yes, uh, basically, um, so in the Philippines, the national team is the Department of Environment and Natural Resources, um, led through the um, Bureau of Marine Biodiversity, and they are making great steps in institutionalizing green fins um, in the Philippines. Um, 
it's got a, a million pesos of national budget allocated to it for this year, and we're doing a huge push for capacity building. As you can imagine, in a country like the Philippines and Indonesia as well, the size of the country is just immense, and the tourism industry is huge and booming and growing. Um, so the more help we have in terms of implementing the program, the better. So I haven't actually spoken to anyone from Operation Wallacea, and so if 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 you do, uh, if I think you said her name is Lorna, if you do have any contacts there, was it Lorna? Yeah, and we can provide all of these questions because some of them are in more detail than I am providing here. So okay. um, we can make sure that you get in touch with all the people who wrote in. Yeah, so basically what it would be, it would be a case of um, an interested party being put in contact with our national team. Obviously, we facilitate that and help that. And then um, the more resources we can uh, put together, the, the wider and the further we can spread green things in, in that country. So, yeah, it would be really good to connect. And we have a, a question from Masa Alistu Salami, as, uh, pardon me for not pronouncing that correctly, uh, who says, thank you for your presentation. I am a researcher on coral disease in the northern part of the Persian Gulf, and I have found human activities such as fisheries and diving very important on coral health, and would like to know if you have observed a relationship between uh, activities and coral diseases and also the the benefits that green fins can provide in terms of preventing coral disease. Gosh, we've got a, a good geographic range here today. <laughs> um, a really, really interesting research topic um, and something that I'd love to have the time to look into, but unfortunately it's not something we've directly done any research in. Um, I mean, obviously there's a connection between um, contacting corals uh, multiple times and perhaps transferring disease between them, and there's been some research papers that um, have looked into that and have confirmed that, that that could be a way of transmitting diseases between coral colonies um, through divers touching and then touching another coral, um, and obviously making them more susceptible to disease by making um, by touching them, by damaging them, and by breaking the, the skeleton, damaging the skeleton um, and the tissues. So there's a lot of research out there, and, and it's something that we use in our awareness raising um, as a reason to not touch the reef. But it's not something that we've done any research into at all, I'm afraid. So um, I look forward to the day that that, that that sort of research is available there. <laughs> well, speaking of research, we have a question from Diana Correa who asks um, that you mentioned one of the expected outputs is increasing participation in citizen science. And can you expand on this in terms of how Greenfins is supporting citizen science and what kind of information you are collecting and how it's being used to help influence decision making? Yes, yeah, so one of the Greenfins Code of Conduct points is to participate in, core, in marine life monitoring and then to submit that data to a regional, national, or international database. Um, and there are so many different citizen science programs out there that um, we don't actually promote a single program globally. Um, what we do is we actually work with uh, the local government or national government or, or people that are working in this area, NGOs, etc., and look and see what data would be useful locally, nationally, regionally. And then we tap into that. So um, something that's, that's practical, doesn't take too much time, can be done perhaps on a guided dive, um, and uh, can be easily uploaded because often in the places that we're working, the, the internet speeds aren't that great. Um, so there's loads of different uh, monitoring methods out there that, that we're promoting, seahorse monitoring, different um, marine life, uh, looking at fish counts. Um, there's reef check that's obviously being used over in um, the Malaysia Greenfins National Team is actually heavily supported or it's partnership between the national government and Reef Check Malaysia, so that's obviously a program that's being promoted there. Um, Reef Watch is a program that was developed by Greenfins in Thailand, which again is monitoring um, coral reefs as well as um, specific indicator species. So um, basically we're just promoting whatever's locally relevant, whatever is locally active, and what's useful, um, if these dive centers are going to be investing their time and energies in collecting this data, we want to make sure that it's being used for something um, globally, nationally. So yeah, we just pick up on, on whatever's being used locally. Right. 
So since this webinar is being hosted in the U.S., there are a couple of questions about partnerships with, with U.S. organizations. And since I sit at NOAA, I will certainly have to ask this one from Suzanne Van Perren, who wants to know if you've worked with NOAA's National Marine Sanctuary System, a network of 13 marine sanctuaries, each with a research, education, and outreach component, a great opportunity for partnerships and collaboration. Sounds fantastic. No, we haven't. And uh, we, we actually haven't um, started any direct work, although we are partnering with a, a number of different US-based um, organizations in terms of sharing our material and trying to get um, the lessons out there. We haven't worked directly with, with anyone to be able to help implement it within any, local, any, any sites there, but it's something that we'd be very open to. Um, I believe that Greenfins is entirely applicable um, to the sites that you just mentioned as well after doing some research. So I think that, um, yeah, we, we'd be very open to that. So um, I guess it's just contacting the, me contacting yes. the right and people actually, or vice versa. <laughs> I, can, I can help make some connections for you there, Chloe, and that I think I agree. I think that's a great opportunity. Great. So a couple of other questions relate to um, ecosystems beyond just coral reefs and how much you're involved in those. Some questions about um, whale shark operations, where those may be happening, and also um, systems where reefs may be part of the ecosystem but not the only attraction, like the Galapagos. Yeah, um, and, and similarly in the Mediterranean where there isn't any coral reef, but yet there's still some very sensitive marine life, you know, is, is Greenfins really applicable to those sites? And the answer is yes. I mean, best practice, um, it's not just looking at direct contact to coral reef. Best practice extends the whole way through the dive operation. Um, we work in sites where um, diving uh, is built on single species such as whale sharks and there's um, best practice for whale shark um, dive where well it's, it's very rarely diving snorkeling or swimming with with whale sharks which of course we promote um, as well so so yeah we do work in non coral reef areas and green things is still very applicable to those sites as well all right uh, a couple of other last questions as we wrap up here. One comment from Richard Smith who says that in Riviera Maya near Cancun, they require ocean safe sunscreens and they don't just require one brand, but they ban certain ingredients. So you could look there for some examples of how oh, they're addressing great. that issue. In where, sorry, can you say again the name? Riviera Maya near Cancun. Yeah, yeah. Yeah, uh, sometimes the, the problem with these products is although it's just difficult to get them distributed globally, so or it becomes very expensive. That's that's the problem that we've come across, and um, because we have actually come across some products that are are good enough to use and are actually proven to be um, low risk to coral reefs, but it's just getting them to the right places. I mean, obviously, the more we can promote tourists to come with these sorts of products, the better. And um, so that's that's also our job, and um, in terms of doing global awareness campaigns with those sorts of issues, which we are doing as well. Yeah, just um, thinking that perhaps uh, Greenfin, since you are certifying, uh, there could be uh, some kind of reef safe sun cream certification just about the ingredients used, not necessarily singling out certain brands. Yeah, definitely. I think that, that there needs to be something um, globally that's actually um, holding these companies accountable and making sure that what, what's being promoted actually is safe for the marine environment. I've, I've, con I've been in contact with a number of different scientists who are very specialized in this area, so I wouldn't think that I or Greenfins could be the, could be the leading voice in that, but I think that definitely there's a, there's a gap to... Um, to have someone who is actually monitoring the different products that are being put out there. And, uh, you know, we've recently had some good presentations on microplastics, and of course a lot of cosmetic companies are starting to pay attention yeah. to microplastics. So yeah. perhaps this is an opportune time uh, to identify, you know, who, who could reach out to some of these cosmetic companies that do provide, you know, make sunscreen, now that they've been sensitized to some of these issues. Yeah, absolutely. I think the time is right, that's for sure. So as we wrap up, I just wanted to mention that you have uh, interest from the Cook Islands and from the Canary Islands, who are also uh, suggesting that you think about those places to implement green fins. 
Great. And, uh, actually, um, both sites, we, we have, we've previously spoken with dive centers there, so just get in contact with me. So uh, I'd love, love to hear from you all. And in general, I think just people want to say thank you, and we really appreciate your, um, your work and your joining us today uh, and sharing this information, uh, helping, helping greenfin spread to a new hemisphere where we, uh, we definitely want to protect our reefs and look for all the tools we can. Great. Yeah, well, thank you very much for hosting this today as well. It's been really nice to, to have an opportunity to reach the other side of the globe, which um, we often don't. So thank you very much. I really appreciate it. And thanks to all the listeners out there as well for your active questions. Really interesting questions coming in. So if you've got any more, then please do contact me afterwards. Um, I really like to hear from you. We will, and we'll be sure that you get the list of webinar participants. And for those who called in, we will post uh, a recording of this webinar so you can share it with your colleagues. Thanks again, Thank Chloe, and, and thanks to our co-organizers. Thank you very much. Bye-bye. <laughs>